on a Friday at the end of what has been for me a long semester, I am really grateful for your presence um, and thrilled to have the opportunity to kind of workshop um, something that has been, to be transparent, a struggle for me for the past kind of uh, 10, 12 months. Um, but what's more excited about today is that I'm not doing all the talking. Um, I have uh, members of my research team, three phenomenal women that will do the presenting today who have also been kind of critical and moving things forward and they'll introduce themselves. But essentially um, what I hope that we can take and what we workshop kind of at the end is making um, good fruit from bad data, right? Um, and that's kind of our argument for what we'll present. So happy to talk about how we squeeze the lemons to make the lemonade and get into quick Q&A um, later on. But I'll be quiet now and next slide. Good morning. So our presentation is called SAD, an analysis of deception in qualitative research studies. It was headed by Dr. Carter, um, Sarah Lynch, Fiona McLeod, and myself, Marella Harris. So essentially our study conducted interviews of individuals involved in MAT, which is medication assisted treatment and MOUD, which is medications for opioid use disorder. Um, primarily this involved nurses, correctional officers and therapists. So during our interview or during our research, we started to notice a lot of interviews that were very similar. Um, and we're just gonna talk to you a little bit today about how we've navigated that. Next slide. So a quick look at our agenda, we're going to start off with a literature review about online data collection, look at our case study explained of all in, move to the data and methods, the thematic findings, combating the sad interviews, points to consider, and future research. Next slide. So just looking at literature in the online data world. With the rise of the internet, we have seen a lot of new challenges with the verifying the data. And specifically, we looked at a study done by Damaris in 2004, who kind of looked at the challenges in qualitative interviewing over the decade. So in 1990, there was a lot of new challenges um, to research practice because there were scholarly debates around the power differentials and researcher participant relationships, the ethical issues in the conduct of research, and the way in which uh, researchers represent participants who are women and people of color. And then with the rise of the internet, the um, new issues have kind of presented themselves, specifically the rise of fake news, false information, and difficulties in verifying participant data. So the main issue that we were presented with was qualitative data is itself the most difficult to verify as people's lived experiences and feelings are <clears throat> often not measurable or traceable. Therefore, it's very difficult to prove they're incorrect. Um, in our interviews, we found that participants were mainly motivated to lie for four reasons, to provide socially acceptable answers that maybe they believed that the interviewer wanted, to avoid sensitive topics, to give answers that please the interviewers and to increase self-worth or their image of themselves. <clears throat> Further, um, we kind of saw that providing monetary incentives as uh, shown by Noel in 2015, really provides mixed results for interviews. A study specifically done by Nunkusing and Cook reveals that there are a lot of difficulties getting authentic interviews, um, especially when participants are paid they conducted a nursing home study where participants were offered a $20 incentive to complete the interview. And most of the researchers found that the participants provided stylized accounts and research or rehearsed narratives rather than actually being truthful because they said they needed the $20. However, there are benefits obviously of having online interviews. Um, it does give more participants the opportunity to participate um, where they might not have been able to do so before. And it can also um, <clears throat> be better because um, participants are more comfortable and at ease during the interviews. Next slide. Next slide. So what is really the, sorry, one back, the contribution of our research and why is it so important? 
Um, in 2017, former President um, Trump declared the a national emergency over the opi opioid use epidemic, and it's because it affects so many Americans. So 2.1 million Americans are directly affected by opioid use disorder. Um, that's six out of every 10 deaths that are directly related to opioids, but it's not just impacting the individuals that have OUD. Um, it's really impacting even broader family, friends, network, other stakeholders, and it is costing the government almost $179 billion. Um, but further than that, it's just the, the death toll continues to climb. So an essential tool that the government has developed to combat the opioid use epidemic is using medications for opioid use disorder, as I mentioned earlier, MOUD and medication-assisted treatment, MAT. So these both involve um, cognitive behavioral therapy, counseling, and um, medications. And when they are administered in the correct amount, they safely can replace opioids, relieve crazing, cravings, and reduce relapse rates. They block the traditional opioid effects on the brain, and they reduce morbidity and the mortality rates from this OUD. Um, however, most of the research has been done on the effect of this and the numbers, not really the qualitative data and the accounts of people that have been involved in MAT treatment. And specifically, there's been very little research that examines the dishonesty in real-time videos um, and specifically pertaining to MAT. So our study contributes to the body of qualitative research surrounding the impacts and the effectiveness of MAT and MOUD programs in the process of collecting data. Next slide. Good morning. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about where our study came from. So it started with the All In Research Project, which examined how and if an employee's identity and perceptions of stress impacted their attitudes and commitments towards the MAT treatment program for specifically justice involved populations. Now this was a part of a National Institute of Health diversity supplement to a larger grant focused on opioid treatment in the justice system more broadly. So to tackle this project, we started to look at for, for participants in four different methods. So the first was to use the same sample as the parent study. However, because of COVID-19, research into this population was happening everywhere. So we saw research fatigue and burnout which decreased the rate of responses. Second, we recruited through professional listservs, including the American Jail Association and networks of medication-assisted treatment professionals. And this also had a limited response due to restrictions on who the listserv could share to. So the third method was to recruit through online groups focused on medication-assisted treatment, LinkedIn and Facebook groups. And this is where we saw the bulk of our fraudulent cases really start to emerge. And our final method was to target Department of Corrections at the state level through email surveys. So this required um, adaptation of our format to a survey someone could do in their own time rather than a Zoom interview. And we also had a limited response, again, due to the research fatigue from the COVID-19 pandemic. So as our fraudulent cases began to pile up, we started to see similarities between them and wanted to dig further into that. And that's where this study came from. Next slide. So let's get into some descriptive statistics here. So our analysis is called SAD, and that stands for spam attempted and deceived because the number of these did make us quite sad. So we decided to play on to that. So our spam cases, as you'll see in blue, were people who were not interviewed and unpaid. They had gone through the email process, signed a consent form, but then fell off the map. Attempted cases were people who were interviewed and we realized they were fraudulent before we went through the payment process. And deceived interviews were those who were interviewed and paid and we realized through post hoc analysis that their um, interview was fraudulent. So the deceived, unfortunately, was about 65% of our total cases, which is just really unfortunate when it comes down to it. All right, next slide. So the demographics of the attempted and deceived only groups were pretty interesting. Of the 66 total interviews conducted, 55 of those people identified as black, 42 were female or males and 13 were females and then 11 chose not to identify. Next slide. 
So now we're going to go through a higher level of analysis with three thematic findings, language, knowledge, and troubling technology. So to start with language, we found significant similarities between um, the language used by fraudulent cases in comparison to the practitioners who we deemed valid. So specifically on the way that our interviewers or interviewees, excuse me, um, described people who were being served within the medication assisted treatment program, our fraudulent cases said the three different phrases, mentally derailed, mentally deteriorated, and mental people. Now, based on our research, this, these are not phrases commonly used by people who have gone through the training in the medical field to be um, qualified for this program. And our practitioners stated patients, clients, and person-first type language, people who have opioid use disorder or, or incarcerated individuals. So we saw these very distinct differences, which was our first red flag was the use of these three mentally derailed, mentally deteriorated, and mental people. And furthermore, on the day-to-day -day tasks, we saw distinct similarities. Our fraudulent cases said seven words. I come in and I check on my patients. That was it. That was what they did every day. And our practitioners had very detailed, very varied responses as to what they did every day based on their position, their role, and how their particular program operated, um, which was, again, another very clear red flag for us. Next slide. Now on to knowledge. So the knowledge of the justice system for our fraudulent cases was very interesting. I'd like you to recall that the majority of our fraudulent cases um, identified as Black. And all of them said that the justice system was very fair and had a positive impact on people with addiction issues. Now, again, based on research, this is not the case. This is not what we would expect them to say. And our practitioners all stated that the justice system was unfair, uncoordinated, criminalizes addiction, and has little understanding of mental illness and the medication-assisted treatment program as a whole. Additionally, on the MAT description, when our fraudulent um, respondents were asked to describe the program. They said the underlying definition. Medication-assisted treatment is the use of medications in combination with counseling and behavioral therapies for the treatment of substance use disorders. Now, when we did some Googling of a simple MAT definition, this is what came up in the majority of websites that we looked at, and that is dictionaries, that is government websites, and that is hospital websites. So, we definitely found this problematic because it was verbatim. This definition was used in the majority of our fraudulent cases, which seems that they were reading off of something they had previously just, um, seen. Uh, next slide. Finally, on to technology troubles. All of our fraudulent cases had very poor internet and audio connection. It was often very difficult to understand what they were saying, and we had to really try to pull information out of them and get them to either reconnect their audio or speak more clearly. It was just very difficult to understand what they were saying. We saw significant similarities in their surroundings as well, uh, specifically a green wall and a pink couch. Now this combination you don't often see. So for us to see it in multiple of our interviews was a huge red flag. It seems as though there were um, people who knew each other that were trying to get a hold of this um, monetary incentive. And finally, most of our fraudulent respondents showed a reluctance to turn on their video, which was a requirement to receive monetary, um, the monetary reward. And we had to remind them several times to turn on their video. Several of them, if um, when prompted to turn on their video, just decided to end the interview altogether rather than risking turning it on, which was a huge red flag for us. Next slide. Obviously, with the number of sad interviews we had, we knew we had to respond to them and adjust in some way. The first reaction we had was to try to decrease the amount of resources that were going into the unusable interviews, specifically by trying to weed out respondents before they actually went through the interviews and the time was taken on that or before they were compensated. We used two main methods. The first um, was asking the respondent to give a specific personal story. Similar to what Fiona just talked about, we had a, very, a lot of very vague and definitely a lot of repetitive stories with multiple respondents giving nearly verbatim answers. Things like, I had a cousin or I had a friend who died of an overdose. Now I want to help people. 
But when prompted further, they were not able to offer any type of unique story regarding their actual job experiences. We also, the second tactic we used was to form a habit of asking for employment verification either before or during the course of an interview, um, especially when the interview started to feel a little bit off. This would be things like asking uh, uh, them to send us their LinkedIn page or confirming the employment directly with the facility. A few times people named facilities that we found out did not exist. Um, and in other instances, the facility would report having never heard of the person when we called them to ask. I personally had one interview where I asked her to send me proof and she asked if she could leave the meeting and come back with proof. And when she came back, uh, she had sent me a screenshot of a LinkedIn page that had no information on it. It had no connections with other people. And the position of her title, which was psychiatrist, was misspelled on the page. So I do believe she left and made it very quickly and sent it to me. And on further inspection, this individual actually had completed an interview with a different interviewer under a different name. Um, as for what to do with the interviews that had already occurred, we conducted post hoc qualitative analysis to look at trends across the SAD respondents in particular, some of which Fiona has already talked about. We're also continuing to improve our research design to account for these SAD interviews, both for the benefit of the current study and to offer suggestions for future studies who use similar methods. One such adjustment that we've made that Fiona did mention uh, is using the questions that were originally for the qualitative interviews in the form of a qualitative survey that we're disseminating to restricted listservs of DOCs that were originally unavailable for the actual full interview. Some other suggestions that we have for future research are one, to be better establish ways for um, legitimate respondents before the data is collected. That would be things like using CAPTCHA software to vet people's legitimacy before they can even schedule an interview with us. Uh, also forming clear standards on how to detect what a fraudulent interview looks like so we know when it's appropriate to cut somebody off. We also assume that nobody is engaging in fraudulent interviews because they don't have anything like better to do with their time. So we know that people are doing it for the compensation. This study did have a, a comparatively large incentive, so that surely caught the attention of some of our sad respondents. And moreover, some of our legitimate respondents were actually unable to take monetary compensation due to the DOC policy. So monetary, non-monetary compensation, things like sending food, maybe like a pizza party or something for the DOC that has disseminated our survey could be one promising change where people are getting rewarded uh, and compensated for participating, but we're not risking uh, drawing the wrong attention with large monetary compensation. And lastly, we did have some really great interviews who shared a lot of stories specifically about their coworkers. These individuals then could be a pathway into providing the contact information for those coworkers or others at their facility or others they know in the field uh, that we would then be able to reach out to with snowball sampling. Um, this is unfortunately something we did see with the sad respondents also, where one obviously was sharing it with other people as evidenced by the fact that we had matching backgrounds and really similar interviews some of the times. So Dr. Carter did joke that we've already had our like summer snowballing happen happening, and now we need like actual real winter snowball sampling instead uh, for legitimate respondents. One caveat that we of course need to address is the risk of rigorous vetting becoming exclusionary. If interviewers are the ones subjectively deciding who does or does not make the cut, they might become over paranoid or jaded, especially if they've had many experiences with invalid interviews, and they might accidentally exclude a legitimate interview who doesn't like feel right or isn't answering correctly. Um, moreover, we know that marginalized communities are easier reached with this virtual data collection, but that brings a risk of impl uh, implicit interview bias during this. So that's why we would suggest conversations and additional research in the methodological community 
on how to recognize fraud in qualitative data and avoid it, but still be able to capitalize on the many benefits of virtual data collection. We also know that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on data collection, especially when it comes to virtual collection there. Um, it's more prominent now. So some of the issues we've discussed have become more salient since the start of the pandemic and the in increase in this type of method. Likewise, any hardships that could have been caused by the pandemic um, might make monetary incentives more attractive, which would play into the issues that I just discussed above. Um, and the last thing to consider is when it comes to dealing with bad data is that a lot of researchers might actually hesitate to reveal that they have that bad data or they have a large amount of bad data, not only because you're admitting to wasting some resources, but because it can set your research timeline back as well. But of course, we wanted to be honest, not only for the integrity of our own study, but also to move the conversation forward on how to address and deal with this fraudulent data issue, especially in the world where virtual data collection is so prominent. So hopefully that's what we're doing here uh, with our manuscript. We hope this is just the start of more research moving towards understanding fraud in qualitative virtual data collection. Um, and we hope to see a lot more coming out. And thank you so much for your time. We're looking forward to any questions or comments or suggestions that you might have. Very well done. Thank you for the presentation. All right. So thank you guys. Thanks for talking. Thanks, Dick, for that. Know the claps. Um, happy to take some questions or just kind of to brainstorm um, anything that kind of caught your attention or things that you're going through that might also help us move the manuscript or the study forward. Um, just to be transparent, um, I'm in this kind of, uh, I'll be with this project um, for an, another year and a half. <laughs> um, the goal in was 160. So uh, that was ambitious to begin with, but it was again attached to a larger study. So um, anything you have going to, um, to help us going forward in terms of publications or actually studying, or if we can help you um, in your um, data collection efforts, happy to take those questions now. Yes, Rebecca. Hi, um, I am currently in school to get my doctorate and I just took a statistics class. So that's what drew me to, to this presentation. Um, and it was really interesting to see all of the, the limitations or challenges that you guys saw. I would love to hear your experiences with um, like checking for validity within like each other and how you, you know, um, how you interpreted what your participants shared and how you confirmed that like what you were hearing from your valid participants was accurate to what their experience was or the way that they described it. Okay, let's start with Marella and go to Fiona. Um, thank you so much for that question. So initially we started realizing that something might have been wrong after probably three or four weeks of interviews. And I was starting to like really feel like something was not right um, because it was the same person, the same voice. And like the emails were sometimes in broken English. And it just like felt like something was not right. And I definitely have been a victim of scams before. So I was like pretty sure that something was not going on. Um, so I just talked to Dr. Carter and she was like, oh, it's a possibility that, you know, this could be happening. And then I think as we added more people to our team, it was kind of um, like a confirmation because they also started having the same problem. So we started talking in between ourselves and we were like, hey, did you see like the the pink couch? Did you see the pink couch in your interview? Like, you know, was your person also, sometimes they would wear like very simple disguises, like a pair of sunglasses or a hat. And um, it was just not, it was very evident that they were all the same or like a related person. So I think really like the group communication of being able to like recognize because of course you don't want to think that people are doing that but um at some point you have to just be honest with yourself that like this is what is happening so really it was once we added more people to 
the interviews and I was doing so many interviews at the time I like didn't want to draw any conclusions by myself but once other people were reviewing them and also noticing the same things and like bringing up what I had thought while I was interviewing the people which is what which is that I did not think they were actually involved in MAT um I think we all kind of came together as a group and like reckoned with the problem and that's kind of how we started developing a plan of how to move forward mm -hmm. um Marilla is absolutely right and again thank you for that question so what really drew me to the fact that there was something wrong was the language that was really the first indicator for me I grew up around the medical field and I have several friends there so to hear someone say that oh I work with mentally derailed people that was something that just threw me for a loop that someone could possibly say that especially someone who's claiming to be a part of the medical field um so that phrase particularly i heard in several videos that i was editing the transcriptions for just to make sure they were accurate and i started to put the pieces together and then i started to analyze more and as you start to listen to these transcripts and watch these videos over and over again it becomes very disheartening that you're seeing and hearing the exact same thing. And then one very, very valid transcription came along and I said, that's it. That person actually works in this program. That's what I expected from someone working in medication assisted treatment. And then, you know, after a while, just figuring that out and doing research on what language is actually used, what kind of training is required, you start to kind of put all the pieces together. And then unfortunately, we had this big body of data that was fraudulent. And I will say just to be transparent, they were flagging me, but it was things like, they would say, oh, I don't think this person is. And then I would say, okay, like, tell me what they said. Like, why, why did they get into the field? And when somebody said, oh, I had a cousin who died of an overdose. For me, as someone who wasn't conducting the interviews, I'm like, well, it's virtual, right? That's sensitive. Somebody passing away, a relative passing away from an overdose is sensitive. And Zoom is not necessarily the place where people are going to be forthcoming around death, right? So immediately I was like, if anybody says that a family member died, just count it as valid, right? Because I didn't feel comfortable, not in it, right, every day doing the interviews, right? I didn't feel comfortable, like, dismissing death, right? And so mm -hmm. it really took kind of this aggregate of themes and patterns to come out for me to acknowledge, like, okay, something's wrong. Because there are some things, like a couple of themes, like death, or um, there was something else that I can't remember what it was, but they would flag me, but I wasn't comfortable um, dismissing something along those lines. So it's a really great um, question, Rebecca. Alex? Hmm. Hi, I'm so sorry. I'm losing my voice because of allergies. So <laughs> I want to just acknowledge that first. But you all, this is a really um, impactful and, and important presentation. So thank you so much for doing this um, and sharing your experience and being transparent. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, or PhD candidate in the clinical psychology program at AU. Um, so I'm currently running my dissertation um, and I'm recruiting um, women who identify as bi plus, uh, you know, under the bisexual umbrella, um, who are currently partnered in a romantic relationship. Um, and I am doing it primarily online. And so I've been completely like um, shocked, I think, by like just the sheer number of like fraudulent um, folks who complete the screener survey. And I don't think that I recognized it, like you all said, like at first because I was like, oh, okay, like lots of responses. This is great. Um, and it was, thankfully, my research advisor had advised that I do a phone call prior to the like main body of questionnaires. So between the screener and the main study. Um, and at first I thought that this was going to be burdensome and I just wanted it to be all online. But now I'm really grateful because it's in that phone call where, um, like you said, there's oftentimes some things that I, like uh, someone who didn't seem to to speak or understand English very well but then with that I was like well I don't want to discriminate like as long as they reside in the U.S. and you know but then you know for instance I, it's a study about you know um, how like intersection of sexual identity and relationships and I'd say well how does your what's your partner's sexual identity and they'd say what do you mean uh, you know what's their sexual orientation uh, man you know and it was like trying to navigate just the constructs that of the of the study. Um, but then I started to notice a pattern in that 
through Qualtrics, which is, you know, the system we're using for the screener survey, it records IP addresses. And um, the folks who seemed fraudulent in terms of um, email addresses that were provided that seemed bogus or names that seemed, um, again, I, I don't like discriminating based on like a name, right? But where it seemed like, you know, Jenny, Sarah or something, right? And it, like two first names or something. And then the IP addresses that have turned out to be fraudulent um, participants are primarily countries in East Asia or Africa. And that like, because one of my criteria is must reside in the US, I'm like, well, they could have a VPN. But again, like uh, when it turns out to be this pattern, I've started kind of using that. And then now that I've started using Research Match as like a, a recruitment area, the, like the website that, that gets for, you know, people interested in participating in studies, I'm able to, like, I'm still getting fraudulent participants there, but they ask about health information. And when you look at the person's health information, if they've selected like every single possible disorder uh, from the list and their BMI is like one or like four, which like, again, BMI I think is BS for a lot of reasons, but if that's not plausible, then I'm like, okay, well that, you know, but again, I, I guess all I'm saying is that like, I found this to be a very um, tricky, uh, difficult uh, thing to be like scientific about because I feel like I'm making judgment calls about somebody's validity. Um, and that feels very challenging. And so I think that towards the end of your presentation, you said like, we've got to come up with like a systematic way to really um, get that validity of like, are you a real person who actually qualifies for my study? That feels so important um, because it, I want it to be scientific so that it's not like I'm using my biases. But anyway, I, I just, I will continue to follow your work and check out the manuscript and everything because this is important. And I just thought I would kind of share my own challenges because it's felt like a, a massive percentage of the folks who express interest in my study um, are fraudulent. And I am compensating financially. So like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah Fiona and Sarah. Yes, of course. So I think that's very, very interesting. And when I was analyzing whether all of our interviews and I made a huge Excel sheet trying to figure out, okay, who did what stage and when did we figure it out? But looking at the names they provided, I noticed the same double first name thing. And I was like, I have a weird name. So I don't know if I can say this, but after 66 of two double first names, you're like, okay, I don't think Marcus Tom is really a valid name. So I am glad you said that because we experienced the exact same thing. And it took me a while to be like, okay, are these just interesting naming choices or is this actually just completely made up? So I appreciated that. And I apologize that you've experienced fraud. It is definitely disheartening for the big research project, but you know, here we are. Yes, Alex, I'm, thank you for sharing first of all. And I'm sorry that you're having a similar experience to us. I was just going to say in terms of what can we do about this? I think it, I mean, here we are both of both our project and yours as well in this kind of post hoc looking at it retrospectively, it's easy to be like, Oh, like clearly this, look at this. Of course it's fraudulent. Um, I can tell now by, by the comparisons I make, but in that moment, I think it's dip, like exactly like you said, it's difficult to say, can I really look at this person and doubt them? Like what, you know, what am I doing that based off of? Um, so in terms of finding ways to know if something is fraudulent, I think the IP address is very interesting. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that one, but verifying that, you know, if I need an all American popula or a population that I'm looking at that I'm only taking IP addresses from America, um, obviously things particular maybe to our study but maybe for yours as well if you're having that similar like summer snowball effect where they're telling their friends it's like oh well this is the yeah. same background um that I've seen in these other ones and and that being a red flag to question something and then the other one that we had to are the having the same person come up again and again which our participants tried either to disguise themselves to keep their cameras turned off or uh, sometimes it was a different interviewer with the the next person, but we were still able to at times say, okay, I, I know I've seen the video that this other person has done because a lot of us have gone through and watched multiple videos. 
uh, for the coding process. So we were able to look at that and be like, oh, I this is a familiar face. This is a familiar voice. Um, I know that I feel comfortable now kind of calling this fraud and moving on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Alex, there's a quick question for you in the chat. Um, what method did you use to verify that IP addresses were US-based? Yeah, that's a great question. So Qualtrics captures the IP address automatically of anyone who fills out your survey. So when I've um, downloaded the data into, I use SPSS, but you know, whatever, if you could even do it in Excel or whatever, um, there's a column that populates automatically with the IP address. Um, and I think that you can see it as well in Qualtrics potentially when you scroll down and it will tell you um, like where it was filled out. Um, and that's been kind of like the, the front line um, way for me to, to deem someone as fraudulent. Um, but the other one thing I'll say is that because I'm doing a phone call, what's very interesting is a couple of the folks who ended up being fraudulent um, insisted on saying, I can't do a phone call. Can you please send me a Zoom link? And I thought that was odd because I was like, why would you want to do Zoom if you're fraudulent? And it, and then they never turned their camera on. And I realized um, there may be difficulty getting access to a phone number, a US phone number. But now folks are using Google Voice, but I can't use that. I don't want to use that as a, a, a like eliminating like an exclusionary criteria because I'm using a Google voice number to call them <laughs> just to protect my own number. So that feels hypocritical. So anyway, I just, it's, it's one of those very sticky things, but IP address seems to be somewhat helpful. Thank you, Alex. JR question. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for everything that I've heard so far. I, I'm a staff member in the, in the counseling center and on the front end of getting ready to do um, some uh, heavy or data analysis and research and um, had a question that may have been addressed early. I had some tech issues, so I was on a little late, so I apologize if it was addressed and you have to say it again. Um, but I'm curious what your experience has been with uh, fidelity questions. Um, if you use them at all, considered using them, if not, why, um, if, and just general thoughts um, related to um, that component of this kind of research. Anybody want to jump in? I think in terms of like fidelity and verification, we were really focusing on, on um, able to provide an explanation of what they did for their job and a personal story. Those were the two things that if somebody was unable to provide that information, there was a really low chance that they were who they said they were, uh, because the ones that we deemed as valid interviews were able to give like extensive stories on both of those ends. Did that answer that question or? Uh, yes, I also have a, a, a follow up, if I may. Of course. Um, so it, it's not clear to me. W w the The questions were not given to the interviewees in advance, correct? No, no, That's correct. Right. Yeah, they were in just asking a question, giving the answer. For the ones that were sent a survey after, the ones that weren't an actual interview, but were sent the survey, obviously they're sent the questions uh, typed out, but. And then one more follow-up question. Sometimes so, I, I've seen in some circumstances, fidelity questions have actually nothing to do with the subject matter that the research team is actually working on. Was that something that was ever considered um, to insert fidelity questions like that? Or um, did it just not come up? Or did it was there a discussion and decided against? Just want to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, so it's a good question, JR. So really what happened was initially, of course, you know, the semi-structured interview guide that went through IRB, right, that was a set of questions that was targeted to the topic. And then what happened, and Morella was on the team first, right, um, then what happened was Morella started noticing things, and then she probed, I guess, down a line of fidelity, right, and that, that looked like kind of tell us what your job is like every day, Right. Um, where exactly did you go to school? Are your colleagues also in the field? Right. She would probe along these very specific lines. So I think um, <clears throat> I think lines of um, fidelity questions kind of organically manifested themselves um, through Morella's skepticism. 
right? Um, and then she would say, hey, Dr. C, she'd send me a text message, hey, Dr. C, now I'm asking about all of this because I don't, right? She would just tell me, hey, I've added these things to the interview guide because these feel, these things feel uncomfortable. And Marella was also able to uh, tell other people, right, when I started adding to the team, to tell other people how to use those questions, right, um, in the process. So I, I get, a lot of this was from I, Marella's skepticism. Um, in terms of kind of like formally adding it to the interview guide as required, I'd never um, made it um, required. So it really just came a lot of times from Morella's instinct and her brain. Morella, do you want to say kind of and give any more examples that I might be missing? Um, I think the main thing was just like when I actually spoke to an, I just think that it was very, after doing so many interviews, it was very obvious to me Um when someone was not being truthful because they may comment on my appearance, they may comment on ask me like really surface level questions like, oh, the weather is nice today or like, where are you? Or they would try to have conversations about something else. And then when you would probe them about if they gave um, a really like heartbreaking story about someone dying, I was kind of like Dr. Carter at first. I was very hesitant to like dismiss that experience because I don't know if that's trauma. And like, I, I, I just didn't really feel comfortable doing that as a researcher. Um, but when they like really would not give me specifics about their specific experiences or when they kind of use some of the verbiage that Fiona mentioned, like the mentally derailed or the main thing I heard was, I go in and check on my patients, like almost as soon as someone said that, um, I would know. And then also all the interviews that were fraudulent were almost always right around 22 to 23 minutes. So I could usually tell by the length they answered of the first question, if it was going to be an interview like that, because our first question, um, like did require some thought. And then on top of that, we had our participants choose fake names. Um, and already we had so many participants that had double first names like John Clark or just like very, very like basic names. Um, and then sometimes they would get really confused with like simple instructions. Like you would ask them to make a pseudonym and they like wouldn't understand or they would make a really really obscure pseudonym um like one of them I remember is like crew 72 like I don't know why you would make it we just asked for like a normal name and like people would just be really hesitant to do that or like they would not understand so there were just so many things on the front end like really as soon as someone picked up um an interview I could tell by the camera quality, the way the camera was positioned, the audio would go in and out, the mic, the screen would go in and out. Like there was just so many things that I noticed over and over and over that it was just like very, very easy for me to detect it really early. And one thing that I noticed um, when Morella started asking about educational background, we had a lot of people who went to Harvard. And based on the way that they were speaking and the vocabulary they used, you could tell that they did not go to Harvard, but that was, you know, they went to this elitist school. Um, and given how small Harvard's population is, like we have a lot of people here who have gotten into this really prestigious school and then started working in the justice system. Um, so that was just one thing I think that was really interesting when we started digging into those questions a little bit. On top of that, sorry, just, I know we're snowballing, but the spam thing really gets me going because I did so many interviews. Um, we would have so many people where their credentials were like, in the beginning, I was like, it's, it's impossible you went through nursing school that quickly. Like, that's not possible. And they would be like, no, no, I'm just very smart. Or like, I'm very like gifted or something. But we'd have people be like, oh, I graduated nursing school. Like, six weeks ago and I would be like oh when did you start nursing school and they were like oh 12 weeks ago and I'm like that's not possible <laughs> like, it's just not possible that you graduated as a nurse in six weeks um or they would be like oh I'm 21 but um I have a PhD or I have a doctorate and I'd be like oh really like from where and they'd be like oh you know the school like they'd make up a school it just it was so like 
almost almost disrespectful to a point because like do you really think that I would believe that that is possible with like the information you're presenting me you're saying you go and gone to Harvard but then like you're calling people who struggle with mental health issues when I like have also struggled with that as like mentally derailed or like crazy people it was just very off-putting I'll put it that way uh, thank you guys thank you for the question any other questions I don't have a question but um my name is Jessica Page and I actually work in the Kogod School of Bus uh, Business on the admissions team and the reason I joined the call today is because in admissions we do lead qualifying and one of the things that we've seen through lead qualification which is basically us indicating whether or not a student is truly interested in our program is a surplus of fake information, data, leads coming into the system. We've done sort of the preliminary putting in the catch for free uh, phase that they have to complete. It is very commonly from the similar countries, as you mentioned as well, they will sign up for Zoom calls. Um, there is no financial incentive. So I think that's also something that's really interesting in comparison to the studies where there is. And so oftentimes then what happens on my end is they don't show. So there's not an incentive for them to join. Um, and so then I end up sort of having time on my calendar that's filled with students whose names are similar or names are A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, mm -hmm. or emails are not accurate. Um, and so I've had to start doing a bit of preliminary work, but really was just sort of curious to see how you all are combating this. And I, I think a lot of it is instinct and a lot of it is also recognizing the patterns that you're seeing within the individuals that are signing up for these sessions. I also was curious to sort of look at what is prompting them to join or sign up given that there is no financial incentive, but we do have an email that's sent out with a, uh, a large amount of scholarship that's listed. But I think when they realize how difficult it is to obtain that scholarship, they might not join, but right. it, it, it doesn't necessarily feel as relevant to the content that you're presenting today, but I just thought it was so interesting given what we're seeing on our side outside of, of studies as well. And really the overlap and the sort of patterns that you're seeing as well that we're seeing here through the admissions team. Yeah, Jessica, I appreciate your comment because actually I find it quite relevant because it's helpful to know where to where to publish, right? So just when you when you're in it yourself and you know when you got this kind of federally funded grant to pull this stuff off and you're training students and hey, this is what this is what I need you to do. And then the majority of their experiences are fraudulent. I made the lemonade, right? We're making this manuscript, right? To get a pub out of it. So it turns into something and it's not just a waste of, for everybody, but we, we also need, it also needs to land in a journal. And what I've learned on these, since we've started these 51 minutes is that this doesn't need to go in a CRIM specific journal, right? Because it's not a, it's not a problem that only plagues our field, even though it felt really personal. <laughs> it felt really personal while I was going through it, right? It actually should go to a much broader outlet um, because in the the part the part of it that um, is specific to the study is more kind of like this is just the lens by which this larger phenomenon is happening, right? So actually, I'm really uh, I appreciate everyone sharing, particularly staff, because it, it points to where I should really. Um, I should really strive for the journal. So a couple of comments in the chat. Um, so thank you, Jessica, so much. Um, and I hope that, hope. I mean, it's, I think it's fascinating. This is re relevant to Stefan's Kramer's comment. I hope I'm saying your name right. Apologies if I butchered it. Um, just a comment, if, it, if that hasn't been done already, it could be interesting, if perhaps expensive, to study what level of financial compensation triggers what degree of fake study participants. And to be transparent about our incentive, it's a $30 Amazon gift card that's delivered via email. Um, structurally, Amazon gift cards um, are very easy to do through AU's um, infrastructure. Um, it's not easy to give cash, right? Clearly cash is much harder. It takes a lot more time. It's not easy to give regular Visa debit cards. They come with an additional expense, right? On top of it, Amazon, there's no taxes and it goes to email address. So it really works well for a virtual space. Um, 
And Alex, thank you for your comment. One more thing I've done that has helped a little bit is ask questions verbally during the phone call that I already asked in the online screener. If they give more than one response that's different than what they said a few days ago, it's a red flag too. Thank you for that, Alex. Um, and Alex is facing an incentive that's a $10 gift card del delivered via email as well. All right, thanks guys. Um, anybody else? You probably have time for maybe one more question or comment or just sharing anything. And Lindsay has dropped an evaluation survey in the chat. So just so you know, we're looking forward to pushing this out. <clears throat> yeah, we can stop screen sharing. We're looking forward to um, pushing this out and um, pushing this pub out in May. So hopefully it's done by the end of the year. It's out um, for you guys to actually look up. Um, but if you have anything else that you want to follow up with, my email is just carter at american.edu. I'll put it in the chat. And kudos to Fiona, Sarah, and Morella for doing an excellent job on the presentation. Incredibly proud of you all. Um, have great days, guys. Happy Friday.